okay, I'm not afraid to admit I've gotten a little behind. So we can't afford to dilly-dally. Let's get right into it. Remember vector projections? They're back. Say we're given a point P and the equation for a plane, and we want to find the distance between that point P and the plane. Here's what we gotta do. Using the equation for the plane, we find a point Q that is on the plane. We draw a vector from Q to P. We draw a dotted line from point P down to the plane so that the line is normal to the plane. We draw another point at the end of that line and call it R. We notice that these three points form a right triangle. We draw a vector from R to P. We'll call this vector N. Now here's the important thing. We notice that the magnitude of vector N, which is the thing that we're looking for in this problem, is going to be the scalar projection of the vector B onto the vector N. And if we're given the equation for the plane and we put it into standard form, we can find the vector coordinates for the normal vector N. And we know the scalar projection of B onto N is N dot B over the magnitude of N. And I practiced finding dot products and magnitudes, so I'm just going to move on from here. Say we're given two equations for two parallel planes and are asked to find the distance between them. Since they're parallel, they're both going to have the same components for their normal vectors, which is why this side is the same for both equations. The only thing that is different is the d value. The equation for the distance between these two planes is going to be given by the absolute value of d1 minus d2 over the magnitude of the normal vectors. So the thing that I really, really, really need to go over tonight is quadric surfaces, which, dare I say, are a little freaky. So, every single quadric surface that can exist is given by this monstrosity of an equation. But here's the thing, this equation also keeps in mind rotation and translation, two things that we're generally not going to need to deal with here. So, generally, our quadric equations are going to boil down into either one of these two forms, which makes things significantly easier for us. I think the sirens have entered the building. So let's take a look at some examples of quadric surfaces, specifically how we're going to draw them generally. Quadric surfaces can be thought of as 3D compilations of conic sections. As a reminder, there are four conic sections, the ellipse, the circle, the parabola, and the hyperbola. When we're dealing with ellipses in relation to quadric surfaces, this is the equation we're looking for. This is the equation for a circle that we're looking for. This is the general form for a parabola. I made a slight whoopsie. This is not a hyperbola. This is. I would uh, say it's because I'm tired, but uh, I was just wrong. <laughs> so for hyperbola, we're looking for we're looking for either one of these two forms. But memorizing them right now isn't important. What is important is realizing the implications of this. We're going to be drawing these quadric surfaces using things called traces. The basic idea is that we set one of our variables equal to a constant and see how the equation behaves. It is much easier to show than explain, so I'm just going to be doing that. Now, we already know that this is an equation for a sphere centered at the origin, but let's try and graph it using traces. So if we set z equal to zero, it is like the z-axis doesn't even exist. So right now we're treating this equation as if we're graphing it on the xy plane. So we see that this is just the equation for a circle. So at z equals zero, we have a circle. So let's set z equal to one and see what happens. So now we see that we have basically the same shape, except it's just smaller. So we see that at z equals one, we have a smaller circle. What happens when we set z equal to negative one? We see we get the same thing. So at z is equal to negative one, we also get a smaller circle. That is the same radius as the one at z equals one. So now let's do the same thing for the x and y axes. Oh my god, I even tried redrawing it and it still looks awful. Okay, that looks at least passable. So we drew our traces on the x axis and we have the traces on the y axis. Now, I'll grant it, this is a terrible, terrible drawing and you should definitely look up pictures if you are looking for an actual explanation on this. But I only care that I'm understanding this and this is fulfilling that purpose. The idea behind this is that there would technically be an infinite amount of trace lines on each axis that would form up 
to make the final solid. We draw trace lines just to get a general idea about what the damn things look like. Of course, there are general equations for all of these surfaces, and I think it will be a good idea to start working with them later, especially because I'm pretty sure that these quadric surfaces are going to be covered on the midterm that's next Friday. Woo! Yeah, I have some time for some public policy. Probably should cover it considering that I have a class tomorrow in it, but this is gonna be fun. My blue marker just ran out of ink. My friend, you served me well. You've lasted a whole four weeks. You will be missed. Rest peacefully, sweet prince. Go contribute to the plastic waste issue like you were meant to. All right, Greeny, you're next. Citizenship has changed throughout four stages of human history. I just held up three fingers. During the first stage, absolute monarchy dominated. And in the absolute monarchy period, we had a lot of centralization of state powers. All the power was up at the top. The feudal system is a great example of this. There was constant warfare between neighboring states. I mean, back then, what else were you gonna do? Talk things out? No, you were gonna go to war, you were gonna go to a monastery. Gross oversimplification of things. I know, it's 10.30 right now. Thirdly, the monarch themselves was strong, held absolute power, and was supported by the elites. Fourth, citizenship didn't really mean anything. I mean, you could be part of a nation, but I mean, it wouldn't really grant you very many benefits. And people were loyal to the monarch that was ruling the nation and not the nation itself. Now I am fully aware that there were exceptions to these cases, the Magna Carta in England being one of them, but even that document is still emblematic of these rules since it was simply an agreement between the king and the elites supporting it. The Magna Carta had nothing to do with the lower class that existed at this time, although it would set the foundation for a lot of later philosophical and political but now watch out everyone and hold on to your horses because here comes the money. That's right, we're getting some pretty fancy and swank new stuff. We're getting the emergence of a commercial and industrial economy and we're getting the technology needed to facilitate that economy. And that can only mean one thing. A new class is entering the fray. It's around this time that the middle class actually becomes a thing. Because people like merchants and lawyers can make absolute bank. Not as much bank as a king, but bank nonetheless. Let's call it minor bank. A small amount of bank. So now, we don't just have the elites at the top and the poor people at the bottom. We have the elites at the top, merchants and lawyers in the middle, and the poor people at the bottom. A little bit more equality, I guess? But this middle class is really, really important for the development of citizenship. Because these people are no longer nothing. They aren't poor. They have resources at their disposal. And when one begins to have resources at their disposal, they begin to think, hey, why the heck? Do I not have the same political rights that the elites do? Out of this questioning emerges new political theories such as the social contract. It's the basic idea that A, government requires the consent of the governed, and B, that there is an exchange between the individual and the state. The state provides protection to the individual, and the individual relinquishes some of their freedom to the state. And out of this discussion about social contract, there emerge two opposing viewpoints. Thomas Hobbes believed that human beings are violent and greedy by nature, and therefore we needed a strong government, or as he put it, a strong leviathan, to protect people from each other. John Locke saw that and said, no, no, hold my rights of man. The premise of his idea is that, hey, humans aren't as crap as Hobbes thinks they are, and because of that, Individual freedom really should be the biggest thing we should be protecting, so limited government is the best way to go. More of a libertarian type. Alright, that's not as much as I wanted to go over tonight, but I think this is a good place to stop, especially considering that it is around 11 o'clock right now. I'm also going to need to go over James Madison's 
Federalist Paper number, Federalist Papers number, Federal, Federal Paper, the one where he defends the Constitution. Uh, but anyway, I, I'm sure that you all can tell how incoherent I'm getting right now, so I am going to quit while I'm ahead. Uh, thank you all for watching. See y'all tomorrow.